Okay, wow. Well, uh, it's a good turnout here today. Um, so there is a follow-along component to this if anyone's interested. Uh, the repository is github.com slash cosmos slash SDK application tutorial. I also just pushed these slides up to a link on the readme. So if you want to follow along with the slides locally, um, pull up the code, uh, code editor, might be helpful. Um, but basically the gist of this talk, I'm gonna talk through the steps to build an application on uh, probably here. <laughs> The, this, this talk, I just try to talk through the core abstractions in the Cosmos SDK and how they're composed to create a full application for you. Um, and probably helpful to give a little bit of background here. Hey, uh, everyone who doesn't know me, I'm Jack Samplin. I do product at Cosmos, Tinderman. And um, we've been working quite a bit on the developer experience for the SDK lately, especially since the launch. Um, Historically, Gaia and the SDK have been developed uh, together, and we've recently taken the step of separating them, and, and the, uh, Gaia now just depends on the SDK repo. So we are a consumer of the SDK as well, along with any other applications that you guys are building. Um, so I'm gonna just talk through the core abstractions here and, and how to build it out. Uh, anyone, and also, as a matter of course, if anyone has any questions, please just raise your hand. I love interruptions and uh, answering questions. So if, if you guys have any throughout the talk, please feel free to interrupt. I'll also do Q&A at the end. Anyone have anything before we start? Yes. Yes. So uh, has the separation of Gaia and Cosmos system here already computed? It's done at yes. Like it is completed. Whatever state it's going to be. Yeah. Like uh, it is completed. All of the releases in the current line, like IE the 034 releases, are all still in the Cosmos SDK repo um, on a series of branches. And then once we do the next network upgrade, probably end of month or early in July is what it's looking like right now, um, at that point, Gaia will be built from the Gaia repo. Okay. So, does that make sense? All right, awesome. Uh, so the SDK is really this developer kit for building your own blockchain. So what does that mean? I mean, in Ethereum, you can build blockchain applications. You know, you could always fork Ethereum or do that, um, do that on your own. But with the SDK, you can use GoLang, which is a great programming language, excellent library support, cryptographic libraries, P2P libraries, all kinds of stuff that you're not going to find in Solidity. It's just a much more mature language. Um, applications built with the SDK can be proof of stake pretty easily. Um, obviously, the Cosmos Hub is proof of stake. And if you use all of the same modules as the Hub, you can copy our proof of stake model. Um, we use Tendermint for consensus and networking. The overall architecture here, which I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, is uh, Tendermint's kind of the root. It, it contains the P2P layer storage and networking. And then applications, i.e. the state machines, uh, are built right on top of that. So there's an interface between Tendermint and uh, the SDK. Um, and the SDK actually just allows developers to focus on the application. You don't have to worry about block production in Tendermint, the P2P network, how the consensus layer works. All of that is abstracted away for you. And all you need to write is methods for changing state and then queries against your application, essentially. So we'll dig into all that in the, in the talk. So what are we building today? Uh, we're going to build a distributed name service that's similar to ENS, Handshake, uh, Namecoin, Blockstack, so what these applications essentially do is you have a human-readable identifier that maps to something that's machine-readable. Like in the DNS service, that's uh, a domain name mapping to an IP or a bunch of other data. Uh, obviously, DNS gets used for a ton of stuff, but this application does exactly the same thing, just in a more limited capacity. So when we're thinking about SDK applications, it's important to remember that this is a modular framework. So uh, all these different modules that we build can interoperate with each other, like IE, uh, the auth module is accounts. So the ability to create accounts within the SDK. So uh, there's a bunch of different modules that use that kind of account functionality. So for example, in the hub, there's the governance module. And in order to make deposits or submit governance proposals, you need to do those from an individual account. So these modules interoperate. There's a core component to the SDK that's called base app, and that's what handles the communication with Tendermint, and where all of the mod and routes all of the queries and uh, transactions to each of the respective modules to handle them. Um, 
each module therefore has its own transaction and message processing. And at the module uh, level, you can also expose CLI interactions and REST server interactions. So you can write your client interactions uh, for developers just right into the module to make them easy to work with. So here we're going to use a really limited set of modules from the SDK. This is not going to end up being a full proof of stake uh, application, and I'll talk about that a bit. But the modules that we're going to use are auth, bank, staking, and params. So auth, as I talked about earlier, is account creation and, and maintenance. Bank is the ability to have balances in those accounts of uh, different coins and to send those coins between accounts. So just your really basic cryptocurrency application. Um, staking, it, it, we're using that to update the set of the validators. In the Cosmos Hub, obviously, staking interacts with a few other modules. Um, here, we're just using it alone. Uh, and then params, this provides a globally available parameter store. So each module, like auth, um, there's some parameters for auth, things like the uh, prefixes to the accounts or, um, hmm, I'm trying to think of what's for auth. Uh, but for staking, there's a number of parameters, like how many validators can we have on this chain, or uh, how long is the unbonding period. All of those things are stored in the param store. So it, it's just a way to kind of store constants for your application that you want to set at runtime. Uh, and we're going to create a module called the name service module that does this kind of distributed name resolution functionality. So there's a bunch of other modules in the SDK, and this is just kind of a brief run through. So distribution, this is uh, for distributing fees and inflation. Uh, in the Cosmos Proof of Stake model, we use inflation to incentivize the validators to bond their stake. Um, that gets distributed through this distribution module. Governance, uh, the ability for validators and token holders to submit and vote on different proposals. Uh, slashing, this is a pretty key part of our Proof of Stake model as well. And this punishes validators for Byzantine behavior or other things that are not good for the network, i.e. lengthy downtime. We don't want validators to have their machines down for a long period of time and, and not be punished or kicked out of the network. Um, mint, so when we're talking about inflation, we actually do need to create some new coins. So there are special permissions for that. There's a module for that mint. Crisis uh, is basically a series of safety checks for all of the other modules. So um, in the bank module, if somebody starts finds a bug and starts minting tokens, this would the crisis module will help halt the chain and prevent, uh, prevent any theft there. And then <clears throat> IBC, which is obviously the ability to talk to other chains. Um, so in, we're merging in more. There's an NFT module that's coming in soon and a few others. So, uh, and, so one thing I do want to note is the security model for this chain. Um, the Cosmos Hub is a, a full proof of stake chain. It, it has all of these various incentives that are, that are meant to keep it safe. Um, this chain we're building is just baking st basic staking mechanisms and essentially a fixed validator set. So this is not, not meant to be used in production. This is just sort of to show you how to build an application. And you could easily add these other modules and make it into more of a production application, but that's a, an exercise left up to the reader. So um, when we're thinking about a state machine, and that's essentially what we're building here when we're building an SDK application, there is application state that's uh, the core of that. And you can think of this as all of the transactions and accounts that are in the blockchain. And, and this is what the, uh, the daemon stores. So within the SDK, and now we're talking about kind of the concepts that make up an SDK application. All the state goes into something that we call the multi-store, which is made up of many just essentially key value stores. If you've ever worked with a database or something like Redis um, or a map, <laughs> um, you're familiar with the key value store. Uh, and it really is that simple, but this key value store uh, runs down through Tendermint consensus and, consensus and then uh, persists to disk after that. So, so it is a bit of a special key value store. Each modules maintain their own KV stores. Some modules don't really manipulate state. Like the bank module only uses the auth module's KV store uh, to keep track of state. It adds balances to accounts, but it doesn't have its own data that it's storing. Um, in, in our application uses only two KV stores really, just accounts and balances, and then domain names. And we'll get into what data is stored there in a bit. 
So when we're talking about modules in the SDK, in this, this kind of gets into folder structure. Um, and if you guys have the, if anyone has the, uh, the repo up, you can see this pretty clearly. At the root, there's a couple of files, but under the slash x directory is where the core of our business logic is written. And uh, inside there, we're gonna have a group of files. We're gonna run through each one of these kind of in order. Keepers are the, is kind of the core abstraction for a module, and it handles changing values and updating the store. Queriers are the ability to query data from this module. Handers, handlers are the ability to write data to the module. Uh, messages define how data is written. Um, types, this is sort of like a generic uh, types folder, so all of your structs would live in there. And then the codec is to register the encoding and decoding formats. And then we also have, as I mentioned earlier, the ability to uh, write your own client interfaces. So new, since the last time I've given this, it, there's a there's also now a top level interface for modules, and, and that's called the app module. And this defines all of the different functionality that a module needs to export in order for it to be used in the SDK. There's two pieces to that. There's this app module basic, and these are the functions that are required for the interface. I'm not gonna go through each one of them in detail, but they're all relatively simple. And, and this is the ability to create a genesis, a, a piece of the genesis file. Each module has a section in the genesis file where you can define parameters, constants, and other data associated with that module that's needed at network start. Um, they can validate their own genesis files, and then all of the client functionality is also exported from this app module basic. Composed within the app module is that app module basic. So this is now the, the layer above the app module basic. It, and this does a bunch of other stuff, like the queriers, your handlers. It also gives you the ability to do um, begin and end block and tenderment. So if you need to perform some functionality at the beginning of every block or at the end of every block to either sort of initialize some state or clean up state at the end, you can do that there. Um, and then obviously more, more genesis logic there. So as I was talking about earlier, the keepers are kind of the core, uh, core abstraction in each module. And that's where all the store updates go through. So this is the most important piece. It specifies essentially getters and setters for each store. And you can pass in keepers from other modules. So we were talking about bank and auth earlier. Auth has the accounts in bank. The bank keeper, when you create one of those, you pass in the auth keeper. And the bank keeper uses the auth keeper to change the accounts within the store. Um, and this is based on an object capabilities model where uh, each keeper has kind of the least amount of privilege that it should be able to have. Like, I, you don't want everything to be able to <laughs> change the balances of accounts within the SDK. So uh, you can provide read-only access to those accounts or it, it allows very fine-grained access control between the code, with, between the, the Go code. Um, and if anyone's in here has written JavaScript uh, before, if you're familiar with React or Vue, these are similar to like reducers in React um, or mutations in Vue. Uh, so, yeah. Um, our keeper, uh, so this is the name service keeper. We need the ability to buy names and then set what data those names resolve to. So, with the ability to buy names, we, we do need the ability to kind of manage these account balances. So, we're going to need that bank keeper. Uh, we also do need our own KV store to store this data, essentially the name mappings. Um, so we're gonna need a store key and then a codec. And, and this allows for encoding and decoding. And then the basic getters and setters that we, we would write, and I'm gonna dig into one of these. But with keepers, essentially you're just writing getters and setters, like get and set, name and price. Pretty, pretty simple. So this is an example of a getter and a setter um, and what it looks like. And you can see that we are first kind of pulling out the KV store um, and, and accessing it with the key. And then we're checking if the name exists. If it does, we're gonna return it. Uh, and if it doesn't, we're gonna return an error. And then the setter, um, if there's no owner for it, we're gonna do one thing. Uh, if there's no owner for it, we <laughs> We, we need to return an error, essentially, and that's what that return does there. And then we'll set it. 
and, and this is just, it is a key value, so it's set by with the bytes that you want, the name with the bytes that you want, so very, very simple. Any questions on this so far? Yes? So when these things are called, uh, whatever transaction like issued the code being executed up to this point, at this point it's already clear that the transaction was yes. signed by somebody and all of these kind of things I don't have to worry about. Yeah, absolutely. That's all. Everything's been validated by the time against here. So these operations look super unsafe, and I totally understand that, but we'll, we'll kind of, we're, we're starting in the middle and, and we're moving outwards. Um, so to your to your question, <laughs> messages come in via the API, and they're validated. Um, they're basically validated. I.e., any stateless checks uh, on validity is the signer of the message the same person who's buying it? Do does this person like so things like that? Are there the basic amount of data that's required to perform the operation, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then within the handlers, that's where the business logic gets executed, and you can also perform stateful validity checks as well, like i.e., does this account have enough balance to perform the, the transaction, those kind of things. So messages trigger handlers. Uh, they're similar to messages you can think of, if anyone's written Solidity in here, the public interface for your Ethereum contract. That's essentially what a message is and it contains the data needed to perform the operation specified. And then once the message gets to the handler, the handlers call the keepers, and those like super unsafe key value methods that we were talking about earlier, and that's how the state transitions are carried out. And that's similar if you've ever written Redux or Vue, that's similar to actions in those frameworks. And handler, most importantly, handlers are where the actual business logic is defined. So if you're familiar with writing like a REST server, your handlers in the REST server is where you kind of write out all your business logic. Very, very similar mental model here in the SDK. And then finally, you go to the keeper to change the state. So what's involved in creating a message? This is obviously kind of a core abstraction here. Five pretty basic methods. <laughs> um, type and route are used to route the message internally to the proper uh, proper module within the SDK, and then finally to the proper handler. Validate basic, these are stateless checks on the message's validity. So this is kind of your first line of defense against spam or anything else. Um, get sign bytes, so this is the bytes that you would sign for the message. Um, generally these functions are partial to JSON and sign, so pretty simple. And then get signers, who needs to sign this? Uh, and we'll see an example of that here. So we've got two messages in this application. For our name service, all we need to be able to do is uh, buy names and then set the value that's associated with them. And for that name buying, the only data we need is what name is it, what's the value we want to set it to, and then who is the owner of that name. And then, and then for the buying, it's the name, the bid, which is an amount of coins, and then who is that buyer. So, Looking through set name, generally each one has a struct, and then there's kind of a constructor, pretty simple code there. Um, and then the route and the type, they both just return basic strings. Uh, and the route is the module name, and then the type is uh, the message name with an underscore, with underscores instead of camel case. So the, the interesting code here is invalidate basic. So what are these stateless checks on the message's validity? Um, if there's no owner in the message, like i.e., how do you <laughs> how do you set the value of a name if there's if we don't know who owns the, the name, um, then we're going to return an error. And, and the SDK does expose a number of sort of convenience errors that, that display nicely in the output, and this is an example of one of them. Um, and then also, if we're not passing in any name or value into this transaction. Uh, we can't set it either. So uh, one thing you could do here is if you had a regex that the message, that the names needed to uh, match, you could also check that regex here or um, do a number of different operations. Get sign bytes, again, we're just marshalling it. Um, one note, marshalling to sorted JSON will generally help you avoid a lot of issues. <laughs> we offer some convenience functions for that. And then get signers, uh, and, and the signer is basically Whoever owns the name needs to sign this message. Yes, Is the sort of JSON otherwise canonicalized, like spacing? And, yes. And so, so it's really canonical JSON you're getting out of it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Mark. How does Amino fit into that? 
Uh, yeah. So uh, Amino is used for the store, uh, the, the underlying data store. So uh, in the keeper back here, that must marshal binary bear. That's that's an Amino marshaling okay. to binary. Um, and for folks who don't know, uh, Amino is essentially uh, a thin wrapper around Protobuf, which is a canonical encoding format that's, that's used by a lot of uh, a lot of projects. Uh, right now, it's not fully protobuf. <laughs> There's a few bugs that we're working out, but uh, we're a couple of we're probably about a month or two away from full protobuf compatibility. So uh, that's that'll be nice. Um, okay. So what other messages could we implement for this application? <laughs> One would be like delete name. Uh, so if you want to go in and kind of like hack on this app afterwards, uh, these would be easy things to kind of like learn this messages concept a little better. Or increase price. So in the current way it is, if I want to buy a name, I can just bid more than the last person paid for it, and I now control it. So this would be the ability to make your names cost more. Uh, any other messages that people could imagine for this name service? Rent. What? Rent? Rent, rent the name. name. Yeah, so you only have it for a certain time. Then that Search. would be much more similar to a traditional name service. Search. That's a query, and we actually have that. Um, so that gets to an important distinction. Um, transactions are only to, like, they're all write operations. Whereas we're going to talk about the query operations here in a second. So I was talking earlier, the handler is where you define your business logic. It's essentially just a router for messages coming into your module. And it's every handler in the SDK is a pretty basic switch statement that looks almost exactly like this. <laughs> Um, and then if we're actually looking at the, the different handlers themselves, and you can think of these just like HTTP handlers, um, this is where we do stateful checks for the validity of the message and then perform any operations required. So you'll see that keeper call there. So here we're checking if the message owner is like, not message owner equals owner. So we're querying the owner of the name, and we're checking that the owner on the message coming in is the same as the owner in state. And if it's not, then somebody's trying to pass this a fraudulent owner, and we need to return an error there. You could perform a bunch of other checks here, but that's kind of the most basic one, and it helps for the majority of cases. Um, and then we just call the keeper, change the name in state, and return. And returning that blank result will actually like pick up a bunch of data along the way and, and return it to the client properly. So you don't really need to do anything with that result there. Uh, like as the result travels back through uh, the module and then through base app, tags and other metadata are added that identify the message, uh, attach the proper return codes, and, and all that kind of fun stuff. So you just really don't have to worry about any of that, which is really nice. Um, so this gets to the queries point. So very similar to handlers, we have a query router as well, but it's just for returning data. And in this application, we have resolve, who is, and then names, which is kind of that search functionality. Um, if you're familiar with any DNS systems, resolve is just the ability to uh, get the string value of the name, who is kind of returns you all the data that the system has on this name, and then obviously kind of that search functionality. Any questions so far? Um, so in the querier, another switch statement, super fun. And this is, in a similar way, in the handlers, you're writing business logic. This is where you're kind of writing your specialized query logic. And this is where you're thinking, how am I going to return this data to clients? And th this data is JSON, generally. Um, you could kind of have your own encoding format here, but that would be a little bit custom and, and would require different uh, client interactions there, but pretty easy to write in yourself if you'd like. And again, here we're just using the keeper to pull the data out of the store and then return it to the user, JSON Marshall. Finally, the last piece of it, and this gets to the Amino. Um, Amino, the encoding format, is used to store these uh, messages on disk in the, the state mutations on disk. And those are amino encoded, and we have to register the messages that we're using so that our codec understands how to handle those. Um, and 
that just is its own file in all of the modules, and it's generally less than 10 lines. So very easy, pretty boilerplate. There's a, yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's doing a little bit of question, but why use the agent for some parts and the mean for other parts? Why not just use the uh, mean for the message for the message serialization? The message serialization? Um, there's not excellent non-Go libraries to work with Amino. So generally what we've done is kind of returned JavaScript, I mean JSON, and sort of allowed the client-facing pieces to, to speak JSON, and then internally we're using Amino to uh, persist that data. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, that's a great question. Um, if you, so another piece of it that I'm not gonna go into super deeply here is uh, the CLI patterns. So you basically take those uh, messages and queries that we just defined and then put them in basic CLI commands and uh, REST handlers. And this allows you to expose this in a programmatic way to users. Um, and we export both of those via the app module basic. So each module like must define these CLI or REST server interactions. Uh, pretty easy to do if you've ever written a REST server. Uh, you basically just have to write a handler and return the data in JSON, which you already have done, so pretty easy. Um, I'm gonna take a quick, and then the kind of final piece of this where it all comes together it is in app.go. So that's substantially everything that encompasses a module. And when you're writing your own custom business logic for your own chain, like that's where you're gonna do the bulk of the work. And then you stitch it together with the rest of the modules out of the SDK in something we call app.go. Basically, just this manifest file where you wire everything together. So I'm going to walk through that in, in a pretty great level of detail here, and, and please stop me with any questions along the way. So what do we do in app.go? We import and initialize all of our app modules. So that that interface that we we talked about earlier, um, we register all the codecs. We have all the handlers and queriers. We wire those up together, and then. Um, for initial application state, there's something called the init chainer, which translates the genesis file, which is kind of like a list of accounts and then parameters and, and any transactions that need to get included in state initially um, into state. And, and we'll go through that in a little bit of detail as well. Yes? Do you have one question? Just from a design um, decision perspective. Yes. Because what I have on the bottom, I have this the handler or the, like the message that actually performs the business logic. And I have to wire it up like multiple times, basically just funneling it from the REST API all the way down. Is yeah. there, do you, are you thinking about basically they could just auto generate the CLI and the REST interface? Like, yes, we're like that's definitely something that I, I would like to have. Um, I think there's a couple of different ways to tackle this. Um, one would be to kind of make more standardized keeper logic and then generate based off that. A little bit difficult. Um, especially because you're going to end up having to write your own handlers because the business logic is going to be slightly different for each of these things. And that, that's where you're going to need to make the customization. But as far as like wiring it all up in app.go, we've substantially abstracted a lot of that away. And then um, as far as generating that stuff, uh, one of the big projects that we're going to be working on in the last half of the year in terms of developer user experience is the ability to scaffold out all of these pieces really easily. So you can think of like, Rails generate models. <laughs> um, that, that's kind of the developer experience that I, I'm trying to build towards. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, so up at the top uh, of app.go, uh, you'll see sort of where, where are my home directories and which modules am I using. And you'll see something here, the module basic manager. This is essentially just an array of modules. And then there's a number of functions defined on that that allow us to register these handlers and do a lot of this kind of repetitive operations and it, it abstracts a lot of that away, which is nice. Um, again, with the codec, you're gonna need a function to create that codec. Module basic register codec iterates through all of the modules and registers them each. So it's just a, a simple wrapper there. Um, you're gonna need to define your application as a struct and that struct is gonna inherit from something called Base app, which we talked about a little bit earlier. It's also got a codec, it's got keys to all of your stores, and, and then references to each one of the keepers for each one of the modules that we're using. You're also going to need to generate a constructor. This is all super boilerplate. 
And again, when, when we're talking about that generator, this is the type of stuff that would be auto-generated when you create an application. So, so the one thing that we haven't really abstracted way yet is you do need to create these keepers and pass in these keys because each keeper does require different keepers, different types of keys. Um, the KB store that we talked about, that canonical one, is persisted to disk at the end of every block. Um, there are some transient stores that allow you to do a bunch of in-memory operations, um, and those get cleared every block. Um, so different types of stores. Uh, that auth subspace that you see there, that's the param store, so the ability to register parameters. Some modules need it, some modules don't. So there's not enough uh, consistency within the way that these modules are initialized to like make that super easy. So you're gonna need to create each of these keepers. Um, it's all pretty boilerplate and simple. And, and then mounting the stores, this is just a housekeeping operation. Um, one thing that's interesting is that app module manager there allows you to set the order of different begin blockers, end blockers, and uh, genesis logic. So, for example, uh, the distribution module for begin blocker like performs a bunch of operations, and those operations need to happen before the slashing operations in begin block. Um, and the module manager offers a nice affordance to do that. Uh, all of this, by the way, as far as ordering for the modules is documented pretty well within the SDK, um, and all of the applications use it. So if you've got any questions for that or we need better docs on that, please open an issue for me. Um, is that in the chair? Yeah, and this is setting the way that we're bringing the Genesis data into state. Um, and if you look at the application, you'll see that in the chainer. It, it is pretty basic. And, and then begin blocker and end blocker. Um, finally, we'll build our binaries. Um, if you take a peek in those files, they're relatively simple and, and pretty boilerplate as well. So pretty much the only non-boilerplate code you're going to end up writing is your handlers and your queries. Yes? Another question um, that maybe it goes too far, but so we're assuming right now this is a chain that starts from Genesis. Mm -hmm. If I'm upgrading an existing chain, like would I also import it somehow in this, or is there another import function if I want to import an existing chain to release a new version of my Chain. Yeah, so if you want to import an existing chain, the method there would be you would kind of pick a height at which you would do the, the state export, and then you would take that state export and translate it into the genesis.json format for your new application, and then boot it up. And it's, it's pretty easy to transfer essentially account balances over from something like Ethereum. You would just dump state from your whole state tree on your app and then translate it into a new format. Is that the? Yeah, we're pretty close. Okay, cool. Any other questions here? 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes for questions. <laughs> um, and once you've got that command all wired up and, and you, you can see the boilerplate code in there, um, then you have two usable binaries, one which starts your application, uh, NSD in this case, and one which uh, you use to perform the client interactions, the CLI, so like you can create new query names. Um, I'm happy to boot them up locally and show you guys if you're interested, or we can just do an extended Q&A. Dean's like, I want to see the demo. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Yes. Um, I'm curious, while you're working on the zero, zero time updates, chain updates, you mean? Zero time chain updates. Can you define that feature slightly? So now you export the state and allow the network. Basically, state of, or, uh, if you now when you relaunch the network, yes, it's, it's completely new matter. Yes, uh, they're asking about how to uh, how to do automated upgrades. Yeah, like a substrate, like you know, yeah, absolutely. Did, did you think about it? Yeah, did we think about it? That was a major feature that we decided not to build prior to launch. There's a lot of additional complexity there, and when you're talking about the SDK, there's a couple of different levels. There's Tendermint breaking changes that we have to deal with, and that's one set of problems, and then the SDK breaking changes that we have to deal with as well. Um, I think shipping really easy upgrades for SDK applications, i.e. the ability to kind of define a state transition function, 
and then allow nodes to restart and keep full transaction history. Uh, that's something that we'll be able to ship relatively quickly. We have a, a company called Regen Network. Is there anyone from Regen here? No. Uh, but they're doing a test net with a way to update the SDK application piece of it um, on a live chain. So uh, we have at least one live prototype out there where people are working on this. There's a couple of proposals, and uh, that's something that we will definitely prioritize uh, on the engineering side in the coming months. Um, but this is something that we did consciously choose to, to not ship with. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Any other questions before I crash and fail on this uh, demo here? Right. Yes. I mean, so you were exporting, you said you have these two parts. One is the client that can interact with the chain that you're yes. starting. Um, can you, do you have other like, client generation things? Like I want to automatically generate a JSON client based on whatever. Yes. So, yeah, so that's another huge area of work for us moving forward. Um, right now we have um, a Swagger file that kind of defines the interface for the existing modules. Um, so you could do code generation off of that. Uh, what we really need to do is have the ability for each module to define its subset of a Swagger file and then the SDK to kind of like put that together. There's some complexity there and we do have somebody working on that. Um, but, and then beyond that, the ability to again like ship transactions back. Um, we don't have it right now. It's something we're actively working on. <laughs> and I think the, the number one area of complexity there is do or do you not want like client proofs associated with this? So like and like client proofs are the ability to prove that the data coming from the full node that you're querying is accurate based on a root of trust. So you could go back and grab the Genesis file from the repo, hash it, and then sync your light client from that root of trust, and then know that whichever node that you're querying from is giving you back the right data. Um, there's a lot of additional work to kind of enable that in these kind of standard REST interactions. And right now, the way they work, they don't give you back light client proofs. It's just kind of a standard REST server. Um, so I think the ability to do standard REST server generated code probably not too hard, should be sometime this year in the next couple of months. Um, but the ability to do light client proofs on top of those JavaScript interfaces is something that there's a couple of, like I was talking about Amino, we needed to change it a little bit to make it exactly like protobuf. We need to get that change shipped and then a couple of other small ones kind of lower layers of the stack before we can enable light clients in those interactions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions? Awesome. Okay, let's see, I think I've got five minutes, so let's see if I can uh, do this thing here. Can everyone see this here? Okay, so uh, when you wire it all together, this is the CLI you're gonna get. Um, there's an excellent CLI library in Go called uh, Cobra. If anyone's used it, it's fantastic. This is a Cobra CLI, and it's one of the things that makes it super easy to make it modular. So this is NSD, this is the daemon. Um, so the first thing that you're going to call is uh, uh, the first thing you're going to call is NSD init. And this will generate a basic Genesis file with no other data in it and just the parameters that you need. So here are the, here are the modules that we were talking about earlier and there's all the, the parameters they have. Um, the next thing we need to do is use the NSCLI to create some keys so that we can have some tokens on this network to, to interact with. So all of your, uh, when you're writing your own queries and transactions, all of those are under the uh, TX and query endpoints there. And you can see that by name and set name. And if you look at by name, you can see that it just takes the name and the amount, and then you sign it with a key, and that's the other key. So pretty easy interaction. NSCLI, keys, 
Matthew comes to Genesis. Um, I think we need to do so this is a Genesis transaction I'm signing that I'm uh, bonding my tokens to a validator so the jack key is going to become my validator so um, Uh, and that collects the Genesis transactions into here, and we'll see the two accounts that I added with the, the stake, um, and then also the Genesis transaction where I'm signing that I'm um, creating a validator. And then in SD start, this should start producing blocks. There we go. Now, let's buy a name. So, TX name service by name. Uh, so the name, does anyone, what, what name do we want to buy here? Agoric. Ah, Agoric. <laughs> no, not Agoric. <laughs> ah, G O R I C. Yeah, thank you. Agoric.agora, okay, and then we need to buy it. Let's say it's going to cost 10 stake from Alice. So the CLI will prompt us before signing. Do uh, correct account sequence and chain ID. Uh oh, what did I do wrong here? Who chain? Well, what's the well, chain ID? What's up? Maybe the chain ID of the Genesis is different than yeah. the Yeah, yeah. Or is the Alice account even in the Genesis account? Chain ID, yeah, I <laughs> Okay. Awesome, great. So that transaction is included. Uh, let's pretty this up. Right, so, uh, and then let's set the value of that name, so, set name, and then we're going to just route this to Google's DNS here. Awesome, and then... We're going to need to resolve that. So, Q name, name service. Transactions. 
You need chain ID? Yeah. What's that? You need the chain ID. Uh, so I, the, there's a config um, that you can set each of those like standard flags. So there's a number of flags that kind of come standard on all SDK things and the config just uh, deals with those. Uh, so I did crash and fail at this demo here. Um, let's see, how many more minutes do I have here? None. None. <laughs> <laughs> Out of time. Yeah. All right. This would totally work if you had more time. Yeah, it would. See, yeah, all I have to do is dig into the code. Just give me, give me another hour, it'll be fine. Uh, anyway, uh, last round of questions before I go here. Yes? Transactions what? Set name, which we oriented with before the output, the variables, uh, the height was zero. Oh. That's a good thing. The height zero, yes. Huh. That's actually. Uh, See, this all looks right. Height 59. The, re the reason why it returns height zero here is actually a, uh, essentially a UX bug. Um, <laughs> Sounds like there's an issue with the uh, query code here, so <laughs> I will have to go fix that afterwards. But uh, any other questions before I wrap this up? So yes. In the name service demo, you yes. were storing the names in the transaction log or in the yeah. Merkle tree? In the Merkle tree. Okay. Yeah. So okay. you have an example of storing <coughs> stuff in the transaction log and having the Merkle tree just have that. So the transaction log, like what, what goes in the transaction log are these tags with that key. Um, that, that, those are the primary stuff that's stored in the transaction log. Um, but there's also, I guess this whole transaction here that you see, like when I query it, that's what's in the transaction log. What's in state is just the mapping of name to value and owner. Right, but there wasn't any... The, the code that you showed, I think, didn't distinguish, you know, put X in the transaction log, put Y in the state. No, it, it didn't. It was just an implicit thing. All of the mutations that you make with the keeper are in state, and then everything that's in the struct with that message struct, that's what goes in the transaction log. We don't have that super yeah. well documented, and that's a great question. Okay. So, you, and so there was construction of a message struct there? Yep. Okay. That's, uh, like, uh, you look at messages.go, all of that stuff is what, that gets amino marshaled and then shoved into the store. Okay. Okay. Thank you guys.